Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Janae Tibsharani and today I'm joined by an Associate Professor of Tax at Victoria University, Dr Lisa Marriott. Welcome Lisa. Thanks Janae. Um, Lisa has been awarded a Marsden grant to investigate the differences between the way tax evaders and welfare fraudsters are treated within our justice system. Three years of data collection and study, and you've concluded, Lisa, all are equal, but some are more equal than others. Uh, yes, indeed. So, <laughs> somewhat provocative title there, but, but deliberately yes. so. Um, look, you've been looking at data, um, sort of comparing the way um, people who have evaded tax have been dealt with compared with those who have, um, you know, evaded or sort of wrangled the, the welfare system. What are some of the key findings that have, that have come from the data you've collected? Okay, so the project started looking at how we treat tax evaders and welfare fraudsters in the justice system. So I started looking at investigations and prosecutions mm -hmm. and sentencing outcomes. So how it turned out is with investigations, we investigate a relatively small proportion of tax evaders each year and, and a higher proportion of welfare fraudsters. So about 5% of people on welfare get investigated versus about 0.01% of, of um, taxpayers. Uh, when it comes to prosecutions, we prosecute most years, um, criminal prosecutions, there's around about 800 to 1,000 for welfare fraudsters. Mm -hmm. For tax evaders, in most years, 60 to 80 criminal prosecutions. And then when you look at the sentencing, uh, so I've got uh, some very nice data from Inland Revenue, and the most serious of cases, so these are the criminally prosecuted cases, for average offending of around about two hundred and seventy thousand dollars, so two hundred and seventy thousand, uh, around about eighteen percent of those uh, tax evaders were receiving prison sentences. Mm -hmm. And by way of contrast, when you look at welfare fraudsters, for an average offending of um, seventy, around about seventy thousand uh, dollars, nearly two thirds, so around about sixty-seven percent of those people were receiving prison sentences. So quite different treatments there. So for roughly around about a third of the level of offending, people engaging in welfare fraud were had about three times as much likelihood of, as of receiving a prison sentence. Right, some big discrepancies. What about the level of um, repayment? Oh, well, that's actually a really good question because I think at this point people think that the differences come about because the tax ev uh, evasion is repaid and the welfare fraud is not repaid. In fact, it's completely the other way around. So in the tax data that I looked at, there were only two cases of repayment, and this is over a period of six years. Uh, so one was repaid in part and one was repaid in full. So that's two cases of 399 cases. Mm. And by way of contrast, mm. with the welfare fraud cases, now they're not always paid, uh, repaid at the time of sentencing, but the Ministry of Social Development does have a, a policy where they will attempt to uh, get all of that welfare fraud money back from the offenders, and, and usually most of it is repaid, admittedly over a long period of time, but it is their policy that, that those funds are collected. Right, so that difference, is that coming from um, the Ministry of Social Development and um, the IRD, or is that coming from the fact that those who evade tax might just have better lawyers and um, you know, put up a better argument in court? Oh yeah, no, that's it's um, certainly part of it. Uh, you know, it certainly will help your argument if you have legal representation, uh, and also if you've had legal resources that have had a lot of time to spend on your case and yep. develop arguments and um, so on. So you know that certainly is um, is part of it. Mm. Okay, the the um, you know how are the the mandates different for the Inland Revenue and the Ministry of Social Development when it comes to handling these cases? Yeah, uh, well again of course the Inland Revenue, their objective is, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, it is to collect the largest amount of tax revenue at the lowest possible cost. And prosecuting people is not, well first of all it's not going to collect much in the way of tax revenue because as I just said, you know, only a tiny proportion of those prosecuted cases actually repay their tax anyway. And of course, it's expensive to take a criminal prosecution. Mm. So inland revenue will do that when they want to make an example of somebody, uh, but it's not going to help them achieve their objective, which is collecting tax revenue for the government. Whereas if you contrast that with the Ministry of Social Development, there does certainly seem to be a wee bit more willingness to, um, if you like to punish people, or to make an example of people um, because of the type of crime that it is. Mm. 
Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's quite an quite an interesting dynamic, and no doubt one that different people might have um, different perspectives on. But what do you see as some of the um, ways forward? You've um, made a recommendation about perhaps having some standardised guidelines that um, judges can use. Can you just explain yeah, that to us? Yeah. So. Um uh, guideline judgments are used in, in other countries and basically what they do is they provide some guidelines for judges as to appropriate uh, sentences for certain types of offending and what it means is that uh, like cases can be treated in a similar way. Now because when we're talking about tax evasion and welfare fraud we are talking about uh, financial offending so it is readily quantifiable. There is an absolute dollar amount of the harm that we are talking about. So it strikes me that a, a guideline judgment would be ideal for the types of crimes that we're talking about here and what that would mean is that any large discrepancies from those guideline judgments would, would be a bit more transparent um, and, and I think you know this is possibly also relevant given some of the media discussions that have been in the um, we've seen in the last few weeks or so with you know suggestions that the, the, the uh, outcomes from the justice system have been different because of people's um, family or who they are or what they do for a living and it, mm. it would just mean that um, th there would be greater transparency in the process. Mm. Okay and also a independent review? Yes, well again, uh, uh, because of some of the work that I've done, but not just solely because of the work that I've done, also because of some of the things we've seen in the media just recently, which mm. have suggested maybe there's some racial inequality in the system. Now that's, does it, that's not my research, it isn't an area that I have looked at, but I think the fact that this is being raised as an issue in society does mean that there's room for investigation of this as an issue, and yeah, you know, perhaps it is time to have an independent review and to take a step back and to look at how we deal with some of these crimes, particularly the financial crimes uh, in the justice system. Mm. Um, how much more resourcing do you think will, will need to be put into this? Actually, and, and this is just jumping back a bit, but how much resourcing has been put in um, to the Ministry of Social Development to investigate potential um, fraud? Yeah. And how much has been put in to, to the IRD? Yeah. You know, do yeah. we have enough resources? Well, so one of the figures that I have uh, received from the Ministry of Social Development and Inland Revenue is the um, uh, amount that they invest in collecting their, their debt. So this is uh, normal debt, as a, including some of the fraudulent funds. So the Ministry of Social Development spends $17 to collect $100 worth of revenue. Uh, Inland Revenue was spending $2.86 to collect $100 worth of revenue. So wow. Inland Revenue are, are not spending as much money in collecting their their debt. I, sh I think I said collecting revenue, it was actually collecting their debt. So yeah. $2.86 to collect uh, $100 worth of tax debt. So they're not spending as much. Um, but of course, you also need to look at the government agency's objectives here and that the inland revenue are there to collect the largest amount of revenue at the lowest possible cost. So to the extent that it's expensive to collect debt, it's probably not going to be a priority for them. So and if they were, if they had specific funding to perhaps investigate more uh, debt and, and try to collect more of their debt, then um, you know perhaps that would be a, a good outcome for them. Uh, we, we were talking earlier, of course, about the levels of debt, and we were talking about tax evasion, and we know that tax evasion, which is detected, is about a billion a year. We don't know what's undetected. I mean, these estimates mm. fluctuate between uh, five to seven to nine billion at the, at the highest level. So that's a lot of revenue where we could be, you know, potentially investing some resource to try and collect that. Sure, I mean that is that is huge. If if you think about you know billions of dollars, if you think about you know what even just the, the Canterbury earthquakes have yeah. cost us in, in yeah. billions of dollars, that is huge. You know amounts of money we're missing out on potentially. What has the um, attitude been from the government as you've put this research? Uh, to v various ministers or um, departments. Oh well, I mean I think. Um I, I haven't had much challenge to, to the, the data. Mm. Um, I think, um, my, well, my overall impression is, is that, you know, people are, are accepting of the, the facts as they are, but there isn't really much happening in the way of sort of willingness, if you like, to review the situation and to think about whether we would like it to be different. And one of the things that, again, you and I were talking about earlier was this whole idea that um, the justice system reflects the views of society. And of course my research does suggest that people don't see tax evasion as a um, more um, 
desirable crime, if you like, people do see, tend to see tax evasion as worse than welfare fraud, right. which is a bit of change of thinking in recent times. That historically, it has been the other way around. Mm. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing the outcomes of the justice system perhaps not best reflecting what society's views are. Mm. Yes, and you've um, concluded that um, from surveys that you've done, so mm. that is, that is, you know, you've got some evidence backing yes. that up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lisa. Just an, another thing is, uh, I guess, another way of perhaps um, leveling the the playing field when it comes to taxes is capital gains tax. What are your views on this? Do you think this needs to be introduced more rigorously to New Zealand? I I do. I do. Um, the fact that we don't have a capital gains tax is an enormous gap in our a tax base. Our our philosophy towards tax in New Zealand is broad base, low rate, and we have a very broad base with our GST, we have a, a, a good base with our income tax, but there is a real gap where we don't tax capital. Now, I think this general idea that the population as a whole uh, has no desire for a capital gains tax actually probably comes from a really significant misunderstanding of what a capital gains tax is and who would be affected by a capital gains tax. So. Pretty much most countries exclude owner-occupied homes from their capital gains tax. So instantly most people who have a house would never be subject to a capital gains tax obligation. However, who it would catch is the people who have a portfolio of investment properties, for example. And if we look at Auckland at the moment, people are making significant capital gains on properties, mm. but those gains are, are not taxed in most cases, where people have structured their affairs appropriately, which most of them have. So those gains aren't taxed, whereas other the people who only have gains in the form of traditional income, for example, wage and salary earners and so on, they will be taxed from the first dollar that they earn. So we do end up with this sort of um, a two-tiered system whereby people who are wealthy, who are the asset owners, the capital owners, can make gains which are not subject to tax, whereas people who are the, the workers, the, mm. the um, income earners, they are taxed. So it does strike me as being particularly unfair. Right, so a good time in New Zealand to have money at the moment. Well, it is. It's certainly a good time to be a property owner. Yeah. Um, but also, I think, given what is happening with our property market, and not just in, in Auckland, it's certainly spreading out now as well, I think it's a really sensible time to be putting this discussion back on the table about a capital gains tax. Of course. I mean, this is uh, this is the time where all the it's all come to a head. So if it's not on the table now, yeah. you kind of have to wonder when it will be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right, Lisa. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I think there's some some key points there, um, and interesting observations about what what public opinion is ar around this as well. So people don't just think, oh, you know those 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 dog bludges, but they are thinking, oh, well, those tax evaders. It would be interesting to see if that sort of sentiment resonates through to the government, and that might be something that it. it might want to act on. Yes, exactly. So thank you for your time. Thanks, and um, I'm Janae Tibshirani from interest.co.nz.